Holy Spirit, Lord, my Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, the mercy on us and save us. Amen. Once again, thank you all for showing up. Uh, today, as we mentioned, we'll go, we'll move on with the, this different book uh, by Father Thomas Hopko. It's called uh, uh, the second volume of the Worship or Elementary Handbook on the Orthodox Church. We'll uh, start with the, the basic stuff about uh, the church building. Uh, we'll talk about the what is the, the altar table, what is the meaning of the sign of the cross, the oblation table, the icons, vestments, Christian symbols. Then we'll move to the second chapter, chapter which is the sacraments, like baptism, chrismation, Eucharist, penance, un holy unction, marriage, holy orders, funeral, monasticism, and so forth. Then the daily cycle, uh, cycles of prayer. We'll talk about the Vespers, Matins, Hours, Compline and uh, evening service, the church year, uh, the pre-Lent, Great Lent, the Lenten fasting, Lenten services, the liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts, the Sundays of the Lent, something that we are now going through through this, uh, through this period, the Holy Week, Holy Thursday, Friday, uh, Saturday, uh, of course, the Holy Pascha, post-Eastern uh, services, then and some of the most important holidays within the church calendar year. Then chapter five talks about divine liturgy. We talk about everything. Uh, we talk about things like uh, the, the divine liturgy in general, the prothesis, the blessed is the kingdom, great litany, antiphon, small entrance, epistle, gospel, fervent supplication, and so on. And then uh, we'll hopefully finish this book by, uh, I don't know, hopefully in a couple of months and we will be able to move on to the, the third volume and so on. But, Today I'm just going to share the screen with you. We'll uh, we'll start with today's lessons. Uh, let me see in the chat, but rather share. Um, okay, here. Okay. I uh, hope you all can see the 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 screen. Uh, we start with the church building. Uh, so in the long history of the Orthodox Church, uh, a definite style of church architecture was developed. Uh, this style is characterized by the attempts uh, by the attempt to reveal the fundamental experience of the Orthodox Church that God is with us. So you will see that uh, in the uh, church architecture, everything has its own meaning, um, and uh, over the time, the churches have become uh, this temple of worship, where uh, even the very design of the church is is here to remind us of the truth that God is with us. If you remember, uh, this is a prayer or a little uh, excerpt from Psalms that we read on Matins, and we repeat it uh, throughout other services as well. So the fact that Christ, the Emmanuel, which translates means, uh, translated means God's, God is with us, has come, determines the form of the Orthodox Church building. God is with men in Christ through the Holy Spirit. The dwelling place of God is within men, the Most High does not dwell in the houses made with hands, says Saint Stephen, quoting the Old Testament prophets. And Paul says that men are the temples of God. And we read this in Ephesians. Uh, uh, Saint Paul writes, "Christ Jesus Himself is the cornerstone in whom the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built into it for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit." This is Ephesians chapter second. 21 to 22. The words of St. Peter are very much the same. In his first encyclical, he writes, come to him, to Christ, to that living stone, and like living stones be yourself built into a spiritual house to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. First Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. We are the temple of the living God, 2 Corinthians 6.16. And it is exactly this conviction and experience that the Orthodox Church architecture wishes to convey. Of course, we all know that the mystical temple of the body of Christ, it's not the building itself, but rather the people uh, who are joined into the same fate uh, in, in Lord Jesus Christ. We manifest that this mostly when we get together the holy eucharist and during those prayers we say the uh, the credo or the symbol of faith which manifests our unity in faith however over the time the need for uh, gathering the the need for ecclesia to get together 
uh, and be in one place of worship became a necessity and glory to God uh, after the, uh, the the freedom that the, the, the church had in uh, 325 before that uh, with the edict of Milan was able to convert many of the pagan temples into the into Christian temples and to uh, become a place of worship. However, the true temple of, of God is the one that it's the bodies, uh, it is the body of Christ himself, which is constituted by us, the people. So the Orthodox architecture reveals that God is with men, dwelling in them and living in them through Christ, the spirit. It does so by using the dome or the vaulted ceiling to crown the Christian church building, the house of the church, which is the people of God. Unlike the pointed arches, which point to God far up in the heavens, the dome or the spacious all-embracing ceiling gives the impression that, the, that in the kingdom of God and in the church, Christ unites all things in himself, things in heaven, and things on earth. This is Ephesians 1.10. And that in him we're all filled with all the fullness of God. Ephesians, Ephesians 3.19. The interior of the Orthodox Church building is particularly styled to give the experience of the unity of all things in God. It is not constructed to reproduce the upper room of, of the Last less Supper, nor to be simply a meeting hall for men whose life exists solely within the bounds of this earth. The church building is patterned after the image of God's kingdom in the book of Revelation. Before us is the altar table, and we can see here on this little scheme, if I, if I hope you can see it on, the, on your screens, it's the um, uh, we we see uh, we see the altar table in which Christ is enthroned, both as the Word of God, the Logos in the Gospels, and as the Lamb of God in the Eucharistic sacrifice. Around the table, so this is he's talking about this little square that we can see, which is called the altar table. So around the table are the angels and saints, uh, the servants of the word, the Logos, and the Lamb who glorify him, and through him God the Father in the perpetual adoration inspired by the Holy Spirit. The faithful Christians on earth who already belong to that holy assembly, fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, Ephesians 2.19, entered into the eternal worship of God's kingdom in the church. Thus, in Orthodox practice, vestibule symbolizes this world, the nave, the nave is this little uh, middle place of the, of the church that you can see here, um, uh, represents the place uh, of the church understood as the assembly and people of God. The altar area, this is the area up uh, north from the, from the nave, uh, called the sanctuary or the holy place, stands for the kingdom of God. In Greek, we call it the hiero, or in, in Serbian, we just call it altar or altar table. Um, the they're they're divided with the icon screen or the iconostas as we call it. Uh, so we have basically, in a way, uh, this uh, very uh, uh, repetition, if you will, from the Old Testament temple. So we have the same structure, the same um, uh, canons, if you will, uh, of how God uh, revealed to Moses to build the temple, actually to, to King David. For, for Moses to build the tabernacle. So we, we have the first part, which is the, the bottom part, it's, called, it's printed here, vestibule, which means, I can just zoom in a little bit. Yeah, okay, this is better. We have the, what we also call the narthex, or the place where uh, those who are uh, non-Christians, the catechumens were dwelling. The nave is the place for the, for the people, which is the middle part. And of course, now we have the altar table. On the altar table, on the left uh, side, uh, the altar is always facing, facing east. Every church in the Orthodox Church are facing east with a few exceptions, uh, but they never faced west. Why? Because the Son of Righteousness Christ on, on his second coming will come from the east. Uh, will, will show us how it is revealed to us. But within the altar, we have the central which is divided between the nave and the altar. We have the icon screen or the iconostas in, uh, that also has the, the, uh, the curtain. And behind, in front of the curtain, we have the royal doors. Those are the doors that only the priest or the bishop and deacon is allowed to get into, to go through them. Uh, and it's a place where uh, they, they represent, in a way, the, the, the same um, doors that we see in the old temple. But... Uh, it's the entrance of the Holy of the Holy. So in the, uh, on the sanctuary, as we call it, or the altar, 
we have the altar table in the middle. Uh, usually during consecration, uh, the, the altar table is being blessed by the bishop, of course. God willing, uh, one day we will maybe we'll be able to talk about this more in details. But uh, every altar table has inside of it uh, a relics of a saint. Uh, there is a uh, there, there's, there are the icons of the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, on every corner of the order table, on the, here on the corner of the table. And during the consecration, it's being covered, of course, blessed with holy water. Certain prayers are being read. It's anointed with holy oil. And it's being sealed with something that's called vosokomastics. Uh, that's a, a special um, kind of a, um, a special liquid that... Uh, Used, was used by, by the kings to seal their, their um, let's say, their uh, letters and important documents. So that same thing is being used to this very day to seal the, the, the very center of the altar table where we put the, the relics and we put the timestamp uh, of the consecration of the, and the letter of the bishop during the consecration of the church. But then on the left uh, upper side in the sanctuary or in the altar, we have the oblation table. That's the place where the priest, uh, when he served the divine liturgy, before the beginning of the liturgy, he uh, served the service of the proscomedi or the proscomedia, the, 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 the service of the oblation, the preparation, the bread of the wine, the later will become the body and blood of Christ. And if you remember during the liturgy, the priest, these are the northern doors, these are the southern doors. He goes out through the northern doors, makes this little entrance uh, that is going from the north through the middle of the church into the through the royal doors and gets into uh, again. This is during the cherubic song, if you remember uh, when you see the liturgy. We'll talk about all of this in details. We we're just trying to cover the basics of how usually the temples. So every temple temple has this structure. If you compare it to our church here, uh, what we have uh, what is called here the vestibule or the the narthex, we don't quite have it here in Lebanon. I mean, we have it, but it's kind of uh, very much a part of the nave where the, the people come. Uh, so maybe the back part when Dewey uh, sells the candles, we can call that the nave in the our, our church, but we don't have an actual nave. In most churches, it's kind of separated, and there are additional, uh, where the two dots here between the vestibule and the nave, we have a little uh, um, doors or openings through which the catechumens can get inside or the uh, faithful can get in, into the nave and through the nave into uh, and the liturgy. So this is basically every Orthodox church has this basics of, uh, of, the, uh, of a temple. This little thing here that you watch in front of the royal doors in the center the, between the, uh, the, the altar and the nave, it's called solea. It's the place where usually when I, the priest comes out to give Holy Communion to people, that's the place in which he stands. And of course, the place where he, from which he gives his sermon or homily and so forth. There is also, there are other uh, uh, elements in the church that we, we're not going to talk about them today because it's going to take a lot of time. We will go slowly to each one of them. Uh, that defines the, the uh, what the church, how the uh, church building should look like. So uh, I'll try to see if we can find some uh, pictures uh, to see what it's like, but uh, maybe to explain a little bit more. But the thing is that what I want you to, to understand is that every church is designed in such a way that can have a fully liturgical function. It is uh, designed and put in use so it can function uh, for the liturgical purposes. Everything is designed because of the divine liturgy, because of the sacraments that are going to be performed over the years in that temple. Every temple has to be consecrated. If by God... Uh, providence, something happens like uh, there was an invasion of the enemies, civil wars, pagans invaded uh, and they destroyed the temple. We cannot serve in that temple until it's being consecrated again. And there are many other canons that we're not going to get into today because we have plenty to talk about other things. But um, the liturgical uh, structure of the temple is the one that uh, gives the, the purpose of the building of, of the churches as we know it. There are many differences, the different architectures of, of, of building the church, but they all have um, the main structure as we can see here. So we have the narthex or the vestibule, the middle part is the nave, and the third and the most important part is the holy of holies or the altar that will divide it with the conostas or the icon screen. So uh, we'll move on to the 
to the altar table. Uh, uh, you can see here in this picture, uh, this is just a, a simple picture. It's not quite, um, uh, not every church has, looks like this exactly, but has a few elements that we have all of them here in our church. Plus we have some icons in our church as well, along with the, with the cross and the menorah or the, the candles. So we have mentioned how the entire church building is centered around the altar table. The altar table does not really symbolize the table of the Last Supper. So this is not just a, the, the altar table is not just a, the, the, the Last Supper. It also sometimes represents the tomb in which Christ was being buried. The altar table, uh, it is symbolic and mystical presence of the heavenly throne and table of the kingdom of God, the table of Christ, the Logos, the word, the lamp, and the kingdom of the everlasting life of God's glorified dominion over all of creation. So now we have also as the throne of Christ. Uh, one of the uh, maybe most important representation of the, the throne of Christ is the icon of Etimas, Etimasia. We can just see if I can find uh, so that uh, you will see the pictures uh, actually about uh, that. Uh, it's, uh, it's the empty throne upon which we are waiting for Christ to come. So here's uh, one picture maybe that uh, can be easy for you to see. Uh, here it is. So we, you see that this is the throne. These are the cherubims around uh, the throne and in the middle, the, the, this dough. Uh, represents the Holy Spirit, which is holding on the throne of the coming of Christ in the last judgment. The reason why it's empty, it is because we're waiting for Christ to come and to sit on the throne and to uh, render his judgment. So we, we, there are many, many interpretations of how, but the function of the altar table is the place where Christ is being sacrificed. He's serving himself the divine liturgy through the hands of the priest, the bishop, of course, and offered later into the divine religion. So the book of Gospels is the perpetually enthroned on the altar table. You see on the altar table, we have this, uh, the book, the Bible, or the, the, the Tetra Evangelium, uh, the four Gospels uh, combined into one book. They're being divided in special sections. We call them Zachala in Translovani, or special chapters that are being used and read throughout the calendar year. So every Sunday, we have specific, uh, we mentioned every Sunday, but every day we have a specific gospel that we read. And they're always changing every year. But 365 days of the year, we read them, especially on the Sundays and especially on big holidays or during the Great Land and so on. So uh, under the, we see that the, the, the gospels have the central place in, in the most holiest uh, place of the Orthodox temple. That's how the scriptures are very important in the Orthodox Church. So it is on the altar table that we offer the bloodless sacrifice of Christ to the Father. And from the altar table, we receive the bread of life, the body and blood of the Lord's Passover supper. This table is the table of God's kingdom in Luke 13, 29. In the Orthodox tradition, the altar table is often carved wood or stone. It is usually wasted with colorful materials to show its divine and heavenly character. It should always be a simple table of proportional dimensions, often a perfect cube, and is always freestanding so that it might be encircled. And this is, again, because of the liturgical function. Why? Because during the ordination, uh, there is a place where the bishop stands on the left side uh, here on the altar, and the newly ordained deacon or a priest who is being ordained, he circles around, kisses all the four corners, of the of the altar table upon which there is an icon of the of the of the evangelists of the spreaders of the writers of the gospels which represents the four corners of the earth the southeast and the west and uh also during the liturgy there are multiple priests who are serving together they stand around the the, the altar so that's why the altar is uh, usually like a cube or depending on the on the uh, on the size of the temple they have this exact uh, uh, important uh, uh, place. So, but let me just before Father Thomas Walker looks like he doesn't mention here this important thing. You see that the, the that the zoom out, zoom in a little bit. You see on the picture, we see that the gospel sits in the center, but underneath there is like a, a red cloth here. You can see. Uh, so this actually is the antimens. Uh, we can see just the. Yes. 
see a picture of Antinous so I can show you. This is every church has something which we call the Antinous. Here, ours looks something like this. Uh, glory to God, our Antinous is very beautiful. Uh, we just got a new when our bishop uh, came uh, into our. Let's see if I can zoom in. So I hope you can see this picture, but uh, here is the Antinous. It's uh, when our bishop came, he, he ordered every bishop when he comes to his new diocese, when he is enthroned into a new diocese, he makes his own antennas. So here we see Christ being uh, prepared for burial. We see the, the nails, we see the, the crown of thorns. We see here on the, on the upper corners, on each corner we see the writers of the gospel. On the left corner, upper side, we see St. Matthew, who looks like a human, like an angel. Of course, he's a, not an angel, but because he starts the gospel with the, uh, with the genealogy of Christ, and because his gospel was written mainly to the, to the Jews at the time to understand the human nature of Christ, and that he comes from King David, and this is the promised Messiah. That's why he, in the iconography of the Orthodox Church, always being portrayed or uh, iconographed with, uh, as with a human body. On the right side, we have an eagle who is spreading his wings, holding again a Bible, holding a, a gospel, which is the writer of the last gospel, which is St. John, the theologian. Of course, he's not an eagle, but this is his symbol because the depth or the height of his theology uh, was above all of the other gospels, and that's why he's usually portrayed as, as, a, uh, as an eagle. On the left or corner side, we see the lion at uh, St. Mark, who starts his gospel with the cry of the lion in the desert with St. John the Baptist and announces the gospel to the people. And the right side, we see the calf uh, also with wings. Of course, uh, this is uh, the symbol of the gospel of St. Luke, who, as we read last Sunday, the story about the, the, the slaughtered calf in honor of the turning of coming back of the prodigal son. Uh, is always portrayed on the side. On the bottom here, you see there's like a white stripe here under the, uh, a little, there's a little text here. This is the stripe of the temple to which uh, this antimus or this shroud is being offered to. Uh, this antimus during the liturgy is open like this and the gifts are standing, the discos and the chalice is here. Uh, but underneath it's the name of the temple and usually here would be the signature of the bishop who gave this uh, shroud or this antimins to the uh, priest or to, uh, to, the, to the local parish to serve. So basically every priest serves in the name of, of the bishop. This is very important to understand. There is a structure in the Orthodox Church. We, don't, we are not freelancers that everyone, each one of us can serve whatever he wants, but we are serving in obedience. That's why the priest is a positive zero during the service. He is performing everything with a blessing toward and obedience towards his own bishop uh, with whom he is united in faith, through, through whom he received the priesthood in the first place because the bishops are the continuation of the apostolic succession in the Orthodox Church. So has the, the signature of the bishop. When bishop reposes, and let's say he dies, there's this antimus will no longer be in service, but it should be replaced with the bishop who uh, succeeds uh, the, the reposed bishop, and he issues new uh, antimuses throughout the his diocese through all the parishes in, in whose name we remember. So this is very important to understand because at the beginning, the churches was organized as like that. There was a hierarchical structure. It was the apostles who founded the church. They appointed bishops that they hierotonized or they ordained bishops. And those ordained bishops were the overseers or the shepherds of the local parish. And they said that they, had, they were invested with full um, priesthood inside of themselves. So We'll talk about all of those things later. I just wanted to show you the how an antimus look looks like. God willing, uh, maybe before Pascha, uh, when we open the the big shroud, the one that we on, on the funeral of Christ we circle around, it's very similar to this one. So I can show you in details what it looks like. Maybe one of the oldest. Um, um, if we have some older antimus, I think we have one in the church hall. I can show you exactly what it looks like, and uh, you can see it for yourself. Any priest or any uh, any priest cannot serve without having this particular shroud. On top of the corner, where is the icon of Christ? I hope you can see here uh, where Christ stands as God. He's buried as man, but he is still God. 
there's a little pocket in which we have relics of a saint. Each church has this. In our church, we have the saints of uh, the martyrs of Prebilovac. Those are little children who were being killed by the Nazis. Uh, and uh, we have their relics. They are being kept in a little uh, beeswax, being sealed like that. And then they are being put by the bishop during the consecrations of the Antonesses into, the, into this little pocket. And we're using them to uh, we're using them uh, to, to be there to, for veneration, but they're also they're being anointed with holy myrrh during the consecration. Uh, so uh, that can be done only by the new bishop who consecrates the new entrance. And then, of course, he gives it, distributes that to, to his priests throughout his um, diocese. So that's what I wanted to do because that's a little detail. We'll talk about it a little bit more, but just for now, uh, we, we had to cover this because, uh, of course, uh, we see that and we need to, I want you to know what it is. So on the altar table, one always finds the antinism. This is what he says. This is the cloth depicting Christ in the tomb, which contains the signature of the bishop and is the permission for the local community together as the church. Antimensian or antimens means literally instead of the table. Since the bishop is the proper pastor of the church, the antimension is used instead of the bishop's own table, which is obviously in his own church building, the cathedral, the place where the bishop has his chair, cathedral. This is why I said that the liturgy uh, can be served only with the blessing of the bishop. We serve in his name. For that reason, many times you hear in the liturgy, I spend among the first word, remember that uh, the, his grace our most reverend bishop, bishop and father, Irene, and so on and so forth. The priest serves in his name because every priest is in obedience to his own bishop. This is uh, how uh, how it functions. So the antimesis usually contains a relic, not usually, always, normally a part of the body of a saint which shows that the church is built on the blood of the martyrs and the lives of God's holy people. This custom comes from the early church practice of gathering and celebrating the Eucharist on the graves of those who have lived and died for the Christian faith. Usually a relic of a saint is embedded in the altar table itself as well. As I've told you, during the consecration of the church on the altar, there is also sometimes, very often we put relics of saints into the altar table that are being sealed with this liquid that we call vosokomastics. But also we have relics of, of the martyrs into the into the antimacy. That's why in the Orthodox Church, these are very, very important things, and uh, they play a huge role of the liturgical uh, aspect uh, uh, of the Orthodox Church. They, they, uh, we are connected with, with the saints. Uh, as you know, in the old Christians, uh, in, in the very beginning, they would gather and do the Eucharist on the tombs. They would gather around the cemeteries, and they would use the cemeteries upon the bodies of the martyrs to serve the liturgy. The antimus, which means instead of the place, uh, the, the shroud that I, I showed you just here, uh, we have it here, is also uh, that there because it's then instead of the, the, the bishop. But this shroud, for example, for whatever reason, let's say if we don't have a temple, we don't, we don't have a, a physical uh, place of worship, we can use only the antimus and we can just gather in anyone's house, for example, or even outside under the tree, under the blue sky, and we can, if we have this child or this intonation, we can still speak the divine liturgy. So, uh, we, we, we just have to, uh, we, we just have to, let me see here. Uh, we, that's how the Antimension is very important. So, also on the altar table, there is a tabernacle, often in the shape of a church building. You see here, um, let me just zoom in. This is the tabernacle. Let's just read what he says, and we'll, we'll, we'll explain even in detail. Also on the altar table, there is a tabernacle, often in the shape of a church building, which is re uh, repository for the gifts of the Holy Communion that are served for the sick and the dying. Behind the altar table, there is usually a seven-branch candle stand, which comes from the Old Testament or menorah tradition of the Jewish temple. Generally speaking, the Jerusalem temple is highly valued in the Orthodox Christian tradition of worship and church construction as a prototype of the true worship in spirit and truth of the kingdom of God, John 4, 23. So you see here the, uh, the, the tabernacle that we see here uh, in Serbian, we call it Daro I know it's a long word, but, or the kubuklion is the place where we keep 
uh, a dried portion of the body and blood of Christ for uh, the need of the sick or, or those who are in prisons. So, for example, when somebody is sick and asks, Father Borean, can you please come and give me Holy Communion? I would go into the altar. I would put a, a, a stall around my, the, the, what represents the priesthood. And I will take, open the, this little, tree. there are little doors here, you open, and inside I will break apart a little particles of the body and blood of Christ, put them in a secure place, and then carry out that to the, to the home or to the hospital or to the prison, to the person that we need to give Holy Spirit. There are certain prayers that we read. We mix them and we put a little bit of wine so they can soften, and then we give that to the sick or to, the, to those in prison who couldn't come to church so they can still receive the Holy Spirit. And this is the only time when you use that, uh, when we use also this, this the, the tabernacle is during the, you will see now, with the beginning of the Great Lent, we will serve a service every Wednesday evening for 5.30, which is called the Liturgy of the Presanctified Gifts. Uh, what happens is on Sunday or Saturday, when we serve the liturgy, the priest takes another part of the lamb in preparation for the Holy uh, Communion that dries up being dipped into the blood of Christ and it is being put into this place until Wednesday. So on Wednesday, he uses this to give Holy Communion for people to the people because the, the liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts, that's why it's called pre-sanctified, that the gifts were pre-sanctified on Sunday, for example, or Saturday, is the one uh, that is being distributed to the people uh, during this vesperal service with Holy Communion. And that's what the liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts is. But you will see it's a little bit different than, than, than the liturgy that we usually serve on Sunday. Uh, you will see that during the beginning of the Lent. We'll start that, God willing, on March the 7th of Lent, and on the first Wednesday up until the end of Pascha. This is the service that is being served only during the Great Lent. We never serve it outside of that. Why? Because from Monday to Friday, it's not allowed, according to the canvas, to serve a full divine liturgy unless... Uh, it's a big holiday like Annunciation, or maybe there is a need by, by, by very, very rare if the bishop says that we can serve for whatever reason. But usually this service is being served uh, and instead of the liturgy, which is the, the vesperal service with Holy Communion. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about all of these things in detail. These are just generational, gen, uh, general uh, explanations. Now let's see what is the oblation table. So as we face the altar area, uh, we have the um, we have the uh, the table of oblation, the table of oblation in which the bread and wine are prepared for the liturgy stand on the left side of the altar table. Let me see if I can find a picture of oblation table, and then we'll uh, so we can see what what exactly uh, looks like uh, images. So, uh, for example, you see here the priest, uh, let me do something more simpler so you don't have to. Uh, that's on the, on the left side. Uh, it's usually, oh, there it is in this picture. Okay, uh, if you see here on the right side of, the, of, the, of your screen, we have the chalice. We have the chalice in which we put the wine. This is the bread. And if you see the, this little piece of bread that looks like a cube, on top of it, it has the sign Isa Chesa Nika, Jesus Christ, the victor. Uh, and this is done during the preparation for the liturgy, during the service of the proskomidia or the proskomidi. Uh, there are some pictures of how the priest is putting water and wine into the chalice during the preparation and how he uh, then consecrates. It usually looks like this. Uh, I'll just uh, try to find better pictures. And this is the seal. This is how it looks like. It is being sealed on the bread when it's being baked. It, you, you, see, you see here, it's inversed because when you seal it on the bread, then it gives the proper um, uh, sealing, which means Jesus Christos Nika, or Christ, uh, Jesus Christ, the victor. Uh, and the other, uh, like a, the triangle here, it represents the uh, little particle we take out for the the most holy Theotokos, which is on the right side, and then on the left side we have this nine. Uh, we, we see this nine uh, little triangle that represent the specific, uh, other specific, uh, important, um, important um, 
saints or, or the angelic hosts or the, the saint of the day that we celebrate, the liturgy that we serve, and so on. We'll talk about that in detail some other time. I'm just trying to uh, give you the basics about those. So the oblation table is the other table, not the altar table, that we use to prepare the, the wine and the bread that will later, during the consecration of the gifts, will become the body and blood of Christ. As I've mentioned to you, God willing, maybe somewhere after Pascha, when we have a little bit more time, we will do the, the oblation service or the proscomedia service outside of the temple so you can all see what we do, what the priest does. There are prayers that he reads, there are uh, things that he does. Everything is done in a prayer. It's like a, maybe an hour, maybe less than an hour of a service of just preparation for the, for the divine liturgy. So we have um, the oblation table, which the bread and wine are prepared, prepared for the liturgy stands on the left side of the altar table, the chalice, the cup for the wine, and the discos, the round plate elevated on a stand for the bread are kept on this table. These vessels are normally decorated with the iconographic engravings, Christian symbols, and the sign of the cross. Uh, just to, he's talking about this, he's talking about this. He's talking about the, the, the chalice, and this is called the discus. This is a plate, elevated plate, and this little, this is the star, and this is the spoon, and there is also a spear that was used uh, uh, to pierce Christ's body on the side by the Roman soldiers, and all of these are being put over. This is usually an icon that we see when we have the service of the of the proscomedia. You see here, there are many chalices, but we use only, during the liturgy, we use one chalice. We use multiple chalices if there are many people, and they're being both put into, into the altar table to be consecrated. But for the purposes of our liturgy, for example, in our church, we use only one. So the discus is this here, and this is the, the chalice. There is an icon of Christ. This icon is called the extreme humility. Uh, Christ being pierced on the right side. And the reason why we put uh, wine and water is because according to the, the Gospel of St. John, uh, the theologian, when Christ was pierced, and even some uh, doctors can tell you that when uh, somebody is dead, if you pierce his liver, you will see that uh, wine and water will come out separated from each other. There's some process that happens in the human body after death that uh, is a sign that this person is tr truly dead. And uh, we wanted to, the Roman soldiers to make sure that Christ was indeed dead, they wanted to pierce him on the right side. So, so these vessels, this chalice and this disc are normally decorated with the iconographic engravings, Christian symbols and the sign of the cross. On this table, there is also a special liturgical knife. Uh, let me, uh, knife symbolically called the spear which is used for cutting the Eucharistic bread and a liturgical spoon for administering the Holy Communion to the people. What you usually see is the spoon, uh, not, not so much the, the spear. The spear is because it's in the altar. Uh, let me see a uh, table spear. What maybe what we'll find, I'll, I wanted to show you. You see here, uh, when this priest, uh, here's the spear, uh, I, I found. It. This is what it usually looks like. Uh, there is a handle the priest puts his hand on, and he uses to cut the, the bread, which will later become the body and blood of Christ. At a certain point, he even pierces the very signature on top of the bread, where is the name Jesus, Jesus, in order to uh, do the same thing what the Roman soldiers did to him when he died to make sure that he died. So this is the spear uh, that you don't see because we don't use it outside, but you see the spoon that uh, the priest is giving Holy Communion to the people. That's also a liturgical element that is always on the oblation table. There are also special covers for the chalice and the discus. Uh, let me see, tell you what is the covers. Uh, just to, to see what, it, what they look like. Um, it's, uh, for example, let's say, what's this? Uh, so, they look, they're in the form of a cross. Uh, so there is also special covers for the chalice and the discus and crucifixion piece of metal called the star, which holds the cover over the Eucharistic bread on the discus. A sponge and clothes for drying the chalice after the liturgy are also used, usually kept there. So this uh, chalice and discus, and there is also uh, called the metal uh, star, uh, let me see, here it is, Maybe we could, oh, there is no middle star, here it is, middle star. So this is the chalice, this is the discus, this little crossword kind of a star, this is the star that stands on top when the priest is finished with his Roscomedia service in order to put the covers, in order to protect it 
from uh, external influence, let's say from wind or from uh, maybe some insects to come in, he covers it. Here we have the spoon and he, we have the spear. So this is all in every Orthodox Christian temple being used. These are here on the left side, we see the covers that are being uh, uh, liturgical items that are used. There is also something uh, that we call the sponge. After the finishing of the divine liturgy, the priest has to consume all of the content inside of the chalice, which is the body and blood of Christ. And after he consumes, he cleans it with hot water. And when it dries up, he puts a little sponge. It's a sea sponge inside of it in order to, if there are any remains of kind of uh, any uh, moisture to be sucked in from this uh, sponge and keep the, the chalice dry ready for the next service for the next day or the next Sunday when everything can be served. A sponge and clothes for drying the chalice after the liturgy are also usually kept there. The oblation table is decorated in a manner similar to the one of the altar table. Above the table of oblation, the table on which the gifts for Holy Communion are prepared, which stands in the altar area to the left of the altar table, one might find various icons. The one that I've shown you, the icon of the uh, enormous humility where Christ is pierced and he uh, he's basically with closed eyes dead and behind him there is a cross. So a favorite one of is that of Christ uh, praying in Gethsemane in, in the garden. Let this cup pass. Another is that of the nativity, although this is due to a symbolical interpretation of the divine liturgy, which is not indicative of the fundamental liturgical tradition of the church. And also there are other examples of certain icons that gives the symbolical explanation of what the proscomity service represents. Of course, that's not so important as much as important of what we have on the altar table, on the oblation table, so we can serve. So these are the things that I wanted you to know. Uh, of course, feel free to ask me. Probably you'll notice there are different colors, and you're wondering why is so many different colors. Okay, let me give you an example here of the. Uh, let's see if we can zoom this picture. Just wanted to. I wanted you to see the. Uh, the picture let's uh, uh why there are so many different colors you see even the priests they have uh different uh vestments sometimes they were red sometimes they were blue or purple and so on and so forth what what's important to know that they all have symbolical meaning we're not going to talk about it too much now, but just wanted to uh, show you. So this is how, for example, a proscomity service looks like, or how the preparation of the of the bread for the for the holy liturgy uh, looks like. We want to find a nice picture so we can see. If not, here it is. Uh, this will maybe make it more uh, easy to understand. So you see here this bread that you see on top of it. Uh, let me see. Can I zoom this? Somehow? Yeah. So you see here uh, on the top of the. I hope you can all see the picture. This is the Jesus Christos Nika. On top of this bread, there is a, a, a seal. Uh, we had a cross, and it's the name of Christ. Jesus Christ, the victor. Nika in Greek means the victor. And it looks like looks like this. Uh, it's being cut in the middle. You can't see here because the, this priest who did this, he had a very precise uh, spear and knife. So you can't see, but it's cut because it's being sacrificed, being turned upside down. He cuts it and he says specific prayers from the Psalms, in which he prepares this bread uh, to become uh, later on Christ during the liturgy. So it carries the name of Christ, it carries the, 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 the function of, of as him as a victor. On the left side, we see here this triangle that represents the queen of glory, which is his mother who gave him birth as, as a human being. And on the right side, you see, and it's also again, there is a psalm that the queen said on the right side of the table and so forth, something that comes from the psalm. That's why she's being placed on the, on the right side. For us, it looks the left, but right from Christ's perspective. Then we have this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine little triangles on the right side, left from Christ, right from us, that they represent a specific uh, remembrance of, of the members of the church. So, so the first one is usually being dedicated to the angelic powers and to the heavenly hosts. 
The second one is given to all of the prophets and the patriarchs, the mainly the prophets, starting with St. John the Baptist and then going back to Abraham, going back to Moses, to David, to um, prophet Daniel, prophet Isaiah, Ezekiel, and so forth. Then the priest takes a little article here that represents uh, uh, that represents the um, uh, represents the the apostles Peter and Paul and all of the apostles on the the fourth one which is on top of the second row. It represents all the hierarchs of the church. It's basically the great warrior theologian, all the hierarchs of the church, the bishops of the church. Then underneath the fifth one represents. All of the great martyrs, the martyrs, men and female martyrs, and he remembers their names, not all of them, but as, as, as much as he can. And then he, underneath on the sixth uh, triangle, he it represents the, the lives of the, all the venerable fathers and mothers of the church who lived in the desert, who lived in monasticism, and so on and so forth. The seventh here triangle on the top uh, right row, on the most right side of here, it represents the unmercenaries or all of those uh, saints who were helping and are still helping uh, the sick, the poor, those in need, St. Cosman Daminus and uh, Pantelemon and many saints. Then the, uh, the, the middle one on the right side represents, or the number eight, it represents the, uh, the, lit the, the day of the saint that we celebrate. So if, I don't know, today if it's St. Spiridon or St. Nicola, his name will be mentioned here on the on this side, and then on the last one we re we remember the saint of which liturgy we are serving. So if it's Saint John Chrysostomos, we remember him. If it's Saint Basil the Great, we remember him. If it's Saint uh, Jacobus, we remember him. But mainly it's usually Saint John and Saint Basil here. You see this uh, in front of Christ here. We have uh, two rows: the first and the second. The first is the rows, the little triangles, but they don't have to be triangles; they can be just particles from the bread. From the other parts of the bread that he cut off the seal and put a piece, he takes commemoration. The first row represents the living members of the parish or the living members that the priest is remembering. He has a list, it's called diptychon, uh, a, special, um, a special list of uh, living members of the parish. They all have to be Orthodox Christians, which he commemorates. And when he takes a little triangle like this, he remembers the name of the person that he's mentioned. And he says the following prayer, O Lord, remember thy servants. And he puts the name, this one, this one, that name, that name. And so on. after he finishes with the living, now remember the departed servants. And then he takes this the second row, the, the triangles, little particles for all the departed members of the order. They're all put next to Christ. So you see the whole proscomedia here that you see here, all of the oblation table gives us the whole church. No one is forgotten. No one is put aside. No one is said, it's not worthy to remember that everyone and every, everything is being remembered here. We have Christ in the center. We have his mother on his right side. We have all the saints, the angelic powers, the prophets, the patriots, the judges, the, the venerable fathers and mothers, the great mothers of the church, all of them on this other side and left side. And underneath we have the living and the departed members of the church, sinners and, and people like us and those who have departed uh, in the resurrection, believing in the resurrection of the Lord. So all of the fullness of the church is being around Christ. Later on during the service, when this bread is being uh, broke, uh, is broke by the priest in four pieces, this little part here that we call it Isa or Jesus is being put into the chalice un, un, untouched, uneaten, unconsumed. The, the part Christos or Hesse is part that the priest or many priests in the service, they eat from it, they take Holy Communion from it. And the part Nika, those these two particles are being given and distributed, put in the chalice, dipped into the blood of Christ, and being given to, to the communicants, to, to the parishioners. Of course, uh, then after this all finished, uh, the priest puts all of those particles together. He spills them. He takes the, the discus like this, and he puts them in the chalice. He's saying the, the following prayer. Wash away, O Lord, the sins of everyone who was mentioned here with thy most precious blood through the prayers of the cross and all of the saints. Amen. And he puts all of those particles into the blood of Christ so that all of our sins and all of our transgressions shall be forgiven and washed away in the blood of Christ. This is uh, something that we will uh, talk about more in the future. I'm just giving you the, the basics of uh, 
of what it looks like just to have a visual representation. We'll, God willing, maybe we will do one day this uh, together so you can see how it's done. Uh, because as you know, women are not allowed to enter the altar uh, unless they have a special blessing to, to get in. We will do the proscomedia service outside so everyone can see it. Uh, and what are the prayers that the priest reading? What is he doing and so forth? Now let's move on to the uh, to the to the chapter of the icons. Uh, let me see why we had the cross here. Uh, maybe, maybe it will be here. Ah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so we have uh, the icons. So in, the, in the Orthodox Church, the icons bear witness to the reality of God's presence with us in the mystery of faith. The icons are not just human pictures of or visual aids to contemplation and prayer. They are the witnesses of the presence of the kingdom of God to us and so of our own presence to the kingdom of God in the church. It is the Orthodox faith that icons are not only permissible, but are spiritually necessary because the word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is John 1, 14. Christ is truly man and as man, truly the icon of the invisible God. We see this in Colossians 1, 15, the 1 Corinthians 11, 7, and 2 Corinthians 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 4. Uh, we said that the icons, the reason why the Orthodox Church venerates the icons, it's not because we want to have, God forbid, idols, or we want to have just some religious pictures. That, no, that's no, not the point. But the icons are the windows into the kingdom of heaven. And most important of all, they defend the truth of the real incarnation of the Son of God, the Logos, becoming flesh and entering into the human history becoming one of us. If we deny the icons, we're basically denying the reality of Christ becoming human being. There, as you know, in the Orthodox Church is considered almost no, no, blasphemous to make an icon of God the Father. Why? Because God the Father was never portrayed anywhere. And no one has the right to do. When we want to say the Holy Trinity, if we want to portray the Holy Trinity, we don't portray the Holy Trinity itself because no one can know the nature of God. But rather we portray the visual representation that we see by Abraham, who uh, was uh, uh, a host to the three angel, angels who came and prophesied to him that next year he will have a son and his uh, wife will be uh, pregnant and, and his name will be Isaac and so on and so forth. Uh, that's the only visual. It's, it's, that's, why, that's why it's called icon, not the essence, not the original, but the icon of the visible manifestation of God. So Christ is truly man and has meant truly the icon of the invisible God because the Lord became flesh and dwelt among us, as John says in 1.14. So the iconostas or icon screen in the Orthodox Church, that's the part that separates the altar from the, from the nave or from the mouse, exists to show our unity with Christ, his mother and all the angels and saints because the Orthodox Church is one huge family. And even though there is a historical uh, uh, distance between now and 2,000 years ago in the Orthodox Church, time does not matter. It is like Theotokos died yesterday or uh, died last year under mission, and now she's going to die again. On this. And this, all these holidays, there's this participants into the constant present, the constant life of the church. There is no past in the Orthodox Church. It's all now. It's all present. So uh, his uh, angels, his saints, uh, it exists to show our unity with God. The altar table, which stands for the banquet table of the kingdom of God, is placed behind the so-called royal gates between the icon of the Theotokos and child and the glorified Christ on, on, on the right side, showing that everything which happens to us in the church happens in history between those two comings of Christ. So the first coming of Christ is like a babe. That's why on the left side, on the world doors, when you enter the church, you see his mother holding him in her his arms and christ is like a baby but on the right side we have only the icon of christ as a grown-up person as he was revealed to us in his last three and a half years of, of preaching of, of, of ministry so we have the first coming of christ and the second coming of christ uh showing to us like a, a, like a grown -up. so uh, of the Theotokos and child and the glorified Christ, showing that everything which happens to us in the church happens in the history between those two comings of Christ, between his coming as the Savior born of Mary and his coming at the end of the age as the king and the judge. The icons on the royal gates witness to the presence of Christ's good news, the gospel of salvation. On our, for example, in our church, we have the Annunciation. We have 
Archangel Gabriel giving a blessing and speaking to, to the Most Holy Theotokos, who is waiting or accepting with Amen his message that she will bear a son, that his name will be Jesus, and he will be uh, the reason for the salvation of many. So the four evangelists who recorded the gospel appear, and often also, because not only the Annunciation, but some, sometimes the four evangelists can be depicted on those four. The icon of the Annunciation, the first proclamation of the gospel in the world. In Greek, the gospel is the Evangelion. The authors of the gospel are the Evangelisti, the, the Annunciation, the Annunciation, the Evangelismos. That's what's the name of the, what Annunciation means, those who have announced the coming of Christ. Over the doors, we have the icon of Christ's mystical supper with his disciples. Um, so well, let me see if I can um, um, find some altar icons. Uh, let me see altar icons. Maybe this is nice. Uh, something you can see. It will be more easier for you to. Uh, inside. Let's see here. Okay, maybe, maybe we can see this. So uh, you see here uh, their icons on the left and the right side. He would be the the the, the, the holy hierarchs of the church, but uh, this church doesn't have maybe this one has. Okay, here maybe we have the best representation. So maybe this one will give you the best uh, how an Orthodox church looks like. So we see on the top here, we see the Panagia or the Most Holy Theotokos having Christ as, as, a, as a child in the middle. We have the angels here. We have on the second layer, we have Christ giving Holy Communion to the apostles. On the left side, he gives them the, his body, the bread, that we take the Holy Communion with the apostles. On the right side, he gives them the, the blood. Of course, Christ was not two people. He was one person, but this is the iconic representation. On the last layer on the bottom, we, we have the holy hierarchs. It's usually St. Gregory of Theologians, St. John Chrysostomus, Basil the Great, and so on. On the table, this is the altar. This is the oblation table. On the left side, we see Christ dead or pierced on, the, on his right side. And this covers, this covers basically the chalice and the, the potidium, or the chalice and discus, the, 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 um, um, the plate, elevated plate, in which we put the bread. And on the chalice, we put the wine and the water. So this is how it usually looks like. Of course, in the Orthodox tradition, we will see quite sometimes a little bit different uh, kind of um, representations. So uh, it, it's up to the, to the tradition of the iconography in the church, which is very old, uh, that, that we feel differences. So over the doors, we have the icon of Christ's mystical supper with his disciple, the icon of the central mystery of the Christian faith and the unity of the church in this world, in the world. It is the visual witness that we too are partakers in the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's Revelation 19.9. That we too are blessed by Christ to eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. Luke 20 to 30. Blessed to eat bread in the kingdom of God. Luke 14, 15. Over and around the central gates are icons of the saints. The deacon's store in the first row for the servants of the altar usually have icons depicting deacons or angels. In our church, we have St. Stephen, the first deacon, first uh, martyr. God's servants. The first row also has an icon of the person or event in, in um, given, uh, whose honor to given building is dedicated along with other prominent saints or events. Just to give you uh, a constas. To, to, to show you the spell this. Okay, here it is. Okay, well, I want you to see this. Okay, here maybe it's the best if you can uh, if you can zoom this picture, you will see what I mean. Okay, it's this one. So I hope you can see this. So we have it's similar to what we have in our church. I hope you can all see this. We have Christ on the right side from us here, the Theotokos 
is uh, on the left side with Christ as a baby. So everything that is happening in the church is because of these two events. We had the historical evidence that Christ was indeed a child, and that's on the left side, and Christ was indeed a grown-up person on the right side that he uh, ascended into glory with this body. So the royal doors are in between because the church is between these two events that happen. Of course, also gives us the glimpse of the coming of the second coming of Christ on, on his eschaton, on his end. On the right side, next to Christ, is usually St. John the Baptist. In our parish, as you know, in our church, we have St. John the Baptist uh, on the right side. Then on the left side, uh, next to uh, his mother to the third of cross, here, I think this is one of the, uh, some saint, I can't read it from here, but it looks like it's probably, I don't know, St. Thomas, maybe. In our church, it's St. Nicholas, even though uh, this is usually the saint to which the church is being dedicated. Because our church is dedicated to the holy resurrection of Christ, we have St. Nicholas. But if, let's say, it was dedicated to St. Spiridon, instead of St. Nicholas, we would have an icon of St. Spiridon over there. Then on the right side, we have the, uh, the uh, archangels. So let me go back into the, uh, into the second row of the icon. So for example, here, just like in our church, on the top row here, we have above this, again, uh, this iconostas, we have the icons of the, of the apostles. You see on the top right here. These are the apostles, the 12 apostles, including Matthias, who was um, uh, elected instead of Judas, who hanged himself and, and betrayed Christ. So depending on the, uh, depending on the size of the iconostas, because in big churches, you can have a lot of icons, there may be rows of icons of the apostles, the major feasts of the church, the prophets and other holy people blessed by God were crowned on top, of, on top by the cross of Christ. In recent centuries, the iconostas is in most Orthodox churches became very ornate and developed into a virtual wall, dividing the faithful from the holy altar rather than uniting them with it. In recent years, this development has happily been altered in many places. The iconostasis in many church buildings now gives first place to the icons themselves and has become once more an icon stand or screen, stasis, uh, rather than a solid partition. So beside the iconostasis, Orthodox church buildings often have icons or frescoes on the walls and ceilings. The canon of church design is to have the icon of Christ the Almighty with the Pantocrator in the center of the building and the icon of the Theotokos with Christ appearing within her found over the altar area. This is Shirsha and Nebes or Platithara Tonura Non. Uh, this is in the altar table here, uh, uh, in the altar. This later icon is called the image of the church, since Mary is herself the prototype of the entire assembly of believers in whom Christ must dwell. She is human. She is not being conceived in a, in a, uh, in a mystical way. She is um, a representative of the human kind. And the reason why she's so venerated in the world of the church is because she represents all of the humanity uh, what humanity could give back to God in offering. And what is that? Christ himself. That's why she is venerated. Not because, like, unfortunately, the Roman Catholics has developed this teaching that the third cross about the Immaculate Conception, the, the ascension of her. It's almost like a deity in, in, in certain Christian uh, denominations. It's not. She is a human being like all of us, but because of the sacrifices that she did and that uh, her enormous humility to be with uh, in one uh, accord with God, it's being elevated. So uh, in the altar, it is also traditional to put icons of the saints who compose church liturgies, which is in Basil the Great, or Theologian, or uh, St. John Chrysostomos. Directly behind the altar table, there is usually an image of Christ in glory, enthroned or transfigured, or resurrected, and sometimes offering the Eucharistic gifts. And we saw that from the pictures. I will just, uh, we'll finish this little thing, sign of the cross. Also found on the altar table is a small hand cross used for blessing and for veneration by the faithful. The sign of the cross is used throughout the church building on the holy vessels, stand tables and vestments. You see here on this little image, we have the cross. That's the cross that the priest, after we finish with the divine liturgy, when I call everyone to come and take the bread, that's the, the cross that we give for veneration to the people. And this is the sign of the cross we did here with our fingers, how we cross ourselves. The first, this one, two, three fingers united like this represents the Holy Trinity, one in essence. And these two little two fingers represents the two natures of Christ united in one person. 
So the cross is a central symbol for Christians, not only as the instrument of the world's salvation by the crucified Christ, but also as the constant witness to the fact that men cannot be Christians unless they live with the cross as the very content of their lives in this world. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, Mark 8, 34. For this reason, Christians place upon themselves the sign of the cross. The Orthodox place their first two fingers and thumb together to form a sign of the tree in God and cross themselves from the head to the breast and from shoulder to shoulder, right to left. This unique and all-embracing symbol shows that cross is the inspiration, power, and indeed the very content of our lives as Christians. And that man's mind, heart, and strength must be given to the love of God and man. The whole man. That's why we almost cross our half of our body. We cross our forehead, we cross our belly, which represents our physical nature, and we cross our shoulders, which is uh, our spiritual uh, uh, um, strength, so we can grow in Christ and, and ask for the grace of God. So I, I think we'll finish for today with this because we, we'll continue then with vestments and with other important um, aspects of the, of the uh, this is something we're going to talk about. This, you see the priest wearing uh, this called Stiharion, this is called Epitrahelion or the stole, these are the cuffs, this is the zoni or the poyas, the, the belt that the priest has around him. Uh, these are the dikiri and trikiri, it's called the, the candles that the bishops use, uh, which have symbolical meaning as well, and so many things. We'll, we'll cover all of those things just for you to be uh, so it can be more easier to, to understand. Let me see here. Uh, okay, let me just see. Um, stop the picture. Okay, so uh, that's the, the, I would I would just uh, I would just wanted to focus on those little things for now. And God willing, we'll have many things to cover: the Christian symbol, the sacraments. But uh, it's important for for you to just see the basics of, of many of those little things that we have in the church, and it's important to just be able to discern what they are and what is the meaning behind all of them. Uh, we have plenty to talk about all of that, but we, we, we want to go slowly to just explain visually everything, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, God willing, as I've mentioned before, we will be doing the, uh, we will be doing the service uh, in a way that you can all see it, how it's done, which prayer the priest, why do we read those prayers, why are so important, and all of the things that the priest does when he, for example, prepares for the divine serving of the divine liturgy. But in general, every priest, the day before he serves the liturgy, let's say he serves the vestibule service, then when he reads his personal prayer rule that every priest has, he also reads something that we call the canon of the Eucharist, of the preparational prayers for, the, for receiving the Holy Communion. He, he, he reads them in his own name, but also in the name of the parishioners who are coming tomorrow to receive the Holy Communion. And then on the day of the Holy Communion, an hour before the Divine Liturgy, let's say the Liturgy starts at 10, the priest comes at 9, he first starts by reading the, the keros, or the, the keros, the, the, the taking time, the prayers of time. And then afterwards, he enters through the south and doors into the altar. He dresses himself in the vestments. For each part of the vestments, he says a specific prayer that is from the Psalms. And then after he finishes with dressing, he washes his hands with water by saying certain prayers. And then he takes the, the bread, which is the prosperum with the seal that I've showed you. And he starts with the cutting of the bread, again, saying prayers. Everything is done with prayer. And all of these prayers are from the Psalms, from the Psalterium. In the book of Psalms, and then uh, moves on. We'll, we'll, you, you will see one, one once when we talk about this in details. Hopefully, you will be able to see it with your own eyes, so it can be more easy to understand. Most of the time, you don't see this because when people come 9 30, 10 o'clock, uh, the priest is already in the altar and he has already finished those. So you only see the visible part of the liturgy, which is serving of the of the divine, which is okay, that's the most important, but maybe one day we can, we can do this. Uh, so we can show at the church what is the large image of a man without a stretched arms above the congregation uh yeah uh, that's a great question mark uh that's something that we shouldn't have in our church that man it uh there is an image uh, in certain churches of christ older than the ages and he is portrayed like an older man so that's what it's supposed to be. But I think it's misleading to a lot of people when they come to a church. He's talking, I think you're talking about this, Mark. 
about that old man that is on top of where the, the, the chandelier hangs. That should supposed to represent Christ older than the ages, ages and is being described in the, uh, the book of uh, prophet uh, Daniel. But uh, the reason why it's misleading, some people think that this is God the Father, which is not. We're not allowed to portray God the Father. There is no icon of God the Father in the Orthodox, Orthodox iconography. There never was, and there shall never be, because God the Father only revealed himself through the voice that says, this is my beloved son, on the day of Epiphany or Theophany, in, in the baptism of Christ in the river Jordan, or St. John the Baptist. And the Holy Spirit is a form of a dove, not as a dove, but we portray him as a dove, because, or as a bird, as a dove, even though he says, like a dove, and he descended on Christ's head. Because later on, we see on the Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is portrayed by the fiery tongues. So we're seeing that, that we're seeing that understanding that the, the writers of the gospel and the witnesses, they were the people who uh, uh, were trying to give a human language to explain to what they experienced. And that's why they use comparison from nature, a bird have, or fiery tongues. What are fire? There are no fiery tongues. No, no one saw fire, but they looked like to them. And that's why they uh, wrote them down so we can understand, have some sort of a uh, kind of a mental picture of, of what's going on. It's a description, but it's not uh, an accurate description. So the same with the icons. It should be Christ older than the ages. But this is something that I guess the, the, the painter of the icon, I don't know, he, he did what he did, whatever. Uh, and that's why it, it, it came out the way it came. Uh, maybe Joe was the one who bribed him, and uh, Joe Rahalovich, and he, he, he made a mistake. But anyway, the, uh, what I wanted you to know, that's not God the Father. Uh, that's not God the Father, because the God the Father does not, is not being painted in the Orthodox Church. You can almost never find an icon. If you find those icons, when you see sometimes God the Father sitting with the Son, and there's like a triangle behind them and, and, and a bird. That's not an Orthodox icon. I think that's a Roman Catholic uh, religious picture. It has nothing to do with Orthodox iconography. There are specific canons in the Orthodox Church that uh, the iconographer has to follow in order to produce an icon or a fresco. That includes a lot of prayer, a lot of theological knowledge of Orthodox Church, dogmatical knowledge, in order not to make mistakes that are being visible or God forbid them even heretical. So the icons are also defenders also of the, the, the truth of the faith, of not defiling the faith, but preserving it as it is. So the icons are like thousand words put in a picture, helping us to uh, revealing us the theology of the church, the true theology of the church, not the heretical one or the schismatical one or, or the secular one. So, um, yeah, I know it's a little bit misleading and confusing, but uh, that would be the explanation. So, okay, it's 7.15. If you have any questions, please feel to, free to ask. Uh, if not, we can finish for today. And the next, uh, next time we'll talk about the, the vestments. We'll talk about the uh, certain items that we have in the church. Uh, and then we'll move on with the Christian symbols, uh, the fish and, and some other symbols. And... God willing, after we finish with that, we'll go with the sacraments. We'll talk about baptism. We'll talk about uh, many. Uh, we'll talk about chrismation, the Holy Eucharist, the Holy Penance, Holy Unction, marriage, Holy Orders, funeral, monasticism, and so on. With the daily cycles of the prayer. So we have plenty to cover, but those are all basics that we would, I want you to know so you can understand many of the things in the church. Feel free to always interrupt me and ask me, and, and, uh, and if you find something unusual or unclear or confusing, you to ask me so we can try to give the best explanation. Yeah, Father Boyan, um, there, in Virginia, there was a priest that said um, something about um, imagining ourselves like behind the figures in the icon or something like that. I was trying to remember what he said, but I don't know if that, any, any of that sounds familiar right now. I don't know what he actually means, but I, I would understand it is that the icons were, let's say, um, uh, iconographic representation of the saints. It means that those saints are like us, that they were human beings like us, that they're no different than us. If we were, if we are sinners, they were also sinners. 
But throughout their life, with God's help, of course, and their personal effort, they were able to fulfill the gospel of Christ in their life and live according to his commandments. So they are being venerated or rather respected by the church family that they were put on the, on the walls of the church, as we call the saints. But the saints are not some super um, natural beings uh, that, that have some superpowers and, or there's something above the rest of the people. No, they're equal. As a matter of fact, when someone is a saint, the, the, the more he understands that he's getting closer to God, the more sinful he feels he is. So uh, the icons, why maybe he said it also is because if you remember when the priest says the holy of the holies, that, that's towards the end of the liturgy before he, after the consecration of the gifts, before we distribute the Holy Communion to the people, before the Holy, giving the Holy Communion, he says that this holy gifts that the priest is holding in his hand before he breaks the bread, the, the, the body and blood of Christ, the body of Christ, the holy of holies, the holy is of the holy ones, which is it was going to be if to those given to those who are present in the church. In the back of the church, behind him, we have the living icons, which is you. So you are also the icons. We are all icons of Christ. God created men according to his image, which is in Greek, icon and likeness, potential. So we are all icons. We are just biological, physical, three-dimensional icons, while on the walls we have two-dimensional depictions of the, uh, the, uh, the, the images of those who lived before us. But they are still alive in Christ, even though we can't see them with our material biological eyes. So that's why maybe he said that we are like, uh, those icons are like, we are behind them because they're not dead people and this is, they're not commemorated as in a form of honor, just let's say like a dead president or, uh, or someone that we commemorate who died a long time. But we are commemorating human beings who, even though they pass from this life to eternal life, they're still alive, very much alive, uh, more alive than they were when they were alive, when they were biologically, physically alive. Maybe that's why he said uh, that, that's what the icons, the icons are the windows into the kingdom. Okay. okay, thank you. And then also, um, I guess like, well, I, you probably already said it, but I mean, the icons besides um, showing the saints, but also show the story that yeah. of the Bible stories. Yes, the icons, yes, the, the frescoes also depict events from, from us. Let's say if we take the, the icon of the transfiguration of Christ, uh, when we see the icon of the, or any icon, but let's say the icon of transfiguration, even the very colors of the icon, they reveal to us theological truths about uh, what, 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 was the, 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 what was the point of that event? What is the, what is the understanding of the event? When we see the baptism of Christ, when we see the Pentecost or any of the icons, the events are there being depicted in order to describe to us in a visual manner, uh, visually give us the, 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 the true theology behind the events. So when we see Christ being baptized in the river Jordan, for example, we see that Christ had a body and that he was indeed baptized by the hand of this prophet John who, who gave the baptism by water that indeed we see the, the this Holy Spirit descending upon him in the form of a dove, in the form of a bird, that indeed we see the words inscribed in the insignia of the icon that God the Father says, this is my beloved son, follow him, and so on. We see the people around, we see the fish, we see a real environment that describes the event. And let's say they uh, played a huge role, especially in the, in the beginning, the church, the icons, and especially the depiction of the events, but icons of the saints were present among the first Christians. I strongly recommend that anytime when you travel to Greece, or if you travel to Rome in Italy, and when you want to see the catacombs, or you've seen the first Christian catacombs, or uh, temples that were underground, or those that were uh, for many years hidden, you know, because, because of the persecutions, you will see there are many signs and icons on the walls by the first Christians. So the iconography of the church is not something like a new invention of the fourth, fifth, or whatever century, but it's something that comes from the beginning. St. Luke 
for example, the, the, the writer of the gospel, he was also an iconographer who painted the first icons of the mother of Christ, of, the, of some of the, the apostles, and uh, of many events. And some of his icons are still being preserved. Of course, they're very darkened, and, uh, but we know that they come from him. So the, the writing of the iconography, uh, the iconography was always present in the church. There was a small pause of 120 years, not a small, but still a pause, during the persecution because of the icons, so during the iconoclasticism, which is some uh, Orthodox uh, iconoclast emperors were against the, uh, were against the, the icons, and they forbade them. Uh, and that's the, the time when th this is happening in the 8th century, in the, seventh, in the 9th century. But eventually the church prevails because when we deny the depiction of the events or the depiction of the, the, the life of the saints through the icons, we're basically denying the essential truth that they're historical events. I remember the communists or the atheists in the communist Yugoslavia, for example. They wanted to deny the historical existence of Christ but they couldn't because we had icons. So they had to make peace with that, that maybe this guy was truly a, a historical person because we can't deny the scientific fact of it, which comes from the experience of the church, most of it, all of it. Uh, they were trying to find other lies to defame his, uh, his personality. Well, he was just a gifted man. He was a good speaker and he was that, maybe a magician, but they couldn't deny his historical presence. And that's why the icons and the events are very important in their depiction. Not to be worshipped, that's very important distinction, but to be venerated. We don't worship, we venerate. The difference is like in the words latrevome in Greek, which means worshipping, like an idol, like a, like a deity or God's God, whatever, or proskinisume, veneration. That's different than... than um, worship. We don't worship, we venerate the items and we respect them uh, as the depiction of our beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, uh, that will be it unless you have any questions. Uh, if not, we can, uh, we can wrap it up for today. We can finish for today. And uh, Tomorrow we have uh, our, um, our Bible studies. We will continue from our 6 uh, p.m. We will have the um, continuation of the, our talk that we had about what happens to uh, us when we die, uh, referring to, the, to, this, to many examples of the lives of the saints and to what the fathers of the church are saying about this. We, we have this PowerPoint presentation and I hope that you will find interesting and we can talk about it a little bit more. I want you to remember that uh, this week we will, and next week we'll still have it on Tuesday and Wednesday, but then starting March 7th, uh, our Bible studies and our catechism classes will be on Monday and Tuesday, not on Wednesday, on Tuesday and Wednesday. This is because on Wednesday evening, we can't have the Bible studies, so that's why we do it on Tuesday, uh, because we have the liturgy of the Sanctified Gifts. Okay, let's say the prayer and finish for today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, but not even to the ages of ages. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, the will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, both now and to the ages of ages. Amen. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Okay, good evening to everyone, and uh, we'll see you, uh, see you tomorrow.